Um, it's a strange place. What was that? <laughs> Um, it's waiting for God, Owen. We're going to do, <laughs> do that instead. We've decided against the debate because it's already we've all been covered. We're going to do waiting for God, Owen, and I'm going to recite Jabberwock. <laughs> <laughs> Twas brillig <laughs> and the slithy toves. Um, uh, my name's uh, Ewan McCaskill. I'm a reporter on The Guardian, and I'm here because I've got a Scottish accent. <laughs> um, I was in another panel, and The Guardian sort of transferred me here as well. But I'm happy to be here. The, um, I was at the SNP conference in Aberdeen uh, about two weeks ago, and I was talking to the Scottish correspondents up there, and uh, they were worried that interest in the part of uh, The Guardian and other London-based papers was starting to wane in the Scottish question. But um, So when I came along, I was expecting maybe a, a dozen or 20 people, and it's quite encouraging to see the halls full. Um, just, a, just a quick point, uh, I'm, since I'm chairing this, uh, it's basically going to be a dialogue uh, between Billy and Fraser, but I'm genuinely neutral on this issue. Uh, I, my instinct is normally to support the Labour Party, but when up to the referendum last year, uh, the kind of people who were engaged in the independence were the kind of people I would normally associate with. There was Labour, Socialist, Greens, uh, and uh, you know, the energy they had in Glasgow, um, I started to think, well, maybe nationalism isn't such a bad thing after all. Uh, and so I, I tend to be um, sitting the fence on this one. I don't have strong feelings either way. I'm quite happy to stay in the union, but I'm also uh, the idea of Scotland going its own way and being like Denmark or Sweden, I don't have a problem with that. But the uh, my two colleagues here have got entirely different views. Mm. They've, they've been having exchanges on Twitter. Um, I mean, Billy for a long time has been, uh, way before the referendum, has been um, uh, on the side of uh, independence, prepared to take it seriously as a way of revitalising uh, um, politics in England. And Fraser's, uh, although he's conservative, he's always been decent, reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Unlike all the other conservatives. <laughs> and sort of... But he is a staunch unionist. And the idea was, uh, although they have these exchanges on Twitter, this was a chance for them to come together uh, in public. Um, I, I'll just kick off with a, a couple of questions, but I'd much rather it was an exchange um, with, the, with the audience. Uh, so I'll just have a couple of questions, and then we'll sure, open it up. Sure, sure, yeah. um, in fact, someone said that I should give you the chance to have uh, two minutes each just to state your position. So if I know people say two minutes and then they go on for yeah, five or we ten. Yeah, we tried that at the first one. It went on. We do it for five minutes. It's a bit hard to do it in just two minutes, really. To uh, well, basically, the issue to, uh, for me uh, with regards to uh, Scottish independence is the issue of self-determination. I think uh, the reason the, un uh, the union is uh, breaking apart or in the possibility of breaking apart is because of um, democratic uh, self-determination. Is, is being held back by the first-past-the-post system. Um, in Scotland, people don't feel that they're properly represented uh, at Westminster. I mean, this is not just about independence. I mean, it's also happening within the Labour Party. Um, you know, democratically elected a new leader. We, we don't feel, many of us, that that's been reflected in, in the PLP. And for the Conservatives as well, they feel the same about Europe. They feel that Europe is not really uh, uh, as democratic as it should be. It doesn't uh, represent them, they feel. So there's a general um, a sense, I think, that... that people uh, no longer have agency. That's one of the most exciting things about Corbyn being elected is the sense of agency we've got. And certainly from my experience of being in Scotland during the referendum campaign and since, people do believe they had agency there, whether they are for or against. And my, my excitement about the whole campaign is again, this is something again reflected with Corbyn, is the idea that although people are um, becoming rather ambiguous about Westminster elections and first past the post, and that's why we have these strange results with uh, uh, coalitions and almost you know tiny ma uh, majorities like we have now. Uh, the, the actual reality is that if you give people a vote that really matters, that is to become an independent country or to save the union or to elect a, a genuinely radical leader of a political party 
or to leave the European Union, people will come out and vote because they know with that vote they are having much greater agency than they would in a first-past-the-post election which throws up strangely anomalous results. And I think, the, I would argue, the election result we had is an anomaly. The collapse of the Liberal Democrat vote in the southwest in 15 seats, if that vote had held up, if Liberal Democrat voters and tactical voters who supported him against the Tories hadn't deserted him, then we would still have, I don't think Labour ever would have won, but we would still have um, a coalition. And I think that would be a, a better reflection of where the British people are in terms of their, their sensibility. Because I think we're in a, a process of uh, transformation, a, a, a process whereby the, the way that we do politics is changing, what people want from politics is changing. And Scotland clearly represents that. I think Corbyn represents that because although for all his arcing back to ben, Benism, the people who voted for him, who gave him a momentum, are really, they're looking forward and they're trying to make a new politics be born and obviously with the European referendum coming up there's a determination there to, to use that to say something about who we are and that really is the bedrock of it it's identity politics not in terms of I'm English and you're Scottish it's who I am in terms of my politics my sense of what I can do Ident since ideology has drained out of our politics the politics of ideology has been supercharged I think by individualism and in some ways, the sense of powerlessness is a response to globalisation and the feeling that, that, that power has disappeared off to the Westminster, off to the European Union, or even off to you know, the, the multinational corporations. So in my two minutes, <laughs> that's, that's, where I, that's where I'm coming from. And that's why I think the, 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 this issue is a very important issue for us to tease out these new ideas of a new idea of what it means to be, uh, you know, whether it's Scottish or English or Labour or Conservative or European or not European, these, these are ideas that are, are being born. No point in going back to the old way that we were doing things. Let's, let's use the momentum, let's, let's use that excitement, let's take that agency and try and make, no cliche here, a new politics. Mm. Thank you. And thanks for sticking to the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> not sure I will. Um, Right, but before I was a, a journalist, I was an aspiring musician, and the idea that I'd be on stage with Billy Bragg, you know, <laughs> what a fantastic <laughs> thing. He uh, could have so done Red Wedge with us. <laughs> 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 Not quite the way I'd imagined, but I'll, I'll take it, I'll take it. Um, no, like, but I actually, a, another confession, I wasn't, when, when I was growing up, I really wasn't into politics at all, I hardly ever listened to political speech, hardly ever read a political book, but I did listen to Billy Bragg's music, and like, I imagine quite a lot of you here, it would sort of, the, the thoughts, I mean, he says so much so well. His phrases stay with you. It certainly stayed with me. We get into this because when Billy would, would say something he disagreed with, I did this really annoying habit of trying to quit one of his lyrics back to him. really as annoying. Because <laughs> um, he was right every time. That was, was annoying. He got me every time. Anyway, it's a great way of hooking you. And if, you're, if you want to engage Billy on Twitter, if that's what to do, just get a lyric from Workers' Playtime and he falls for it every time. But I think he's completely right about so much. But he's wrong about the um, solutions. Self-determination, he's right, that's exactly what it should be about. Let's take the self-determination of a, a really bright kid from a council estate who knows he's smart enough to go to university, but is put off by the, um, the living costs. I mean, that is what matters in this country, exactly the same as Inverness, Glasgow, as it is in Newcastle and um, London. Let's take the, the self-determination for a single mother who's working um, three days a week She'd like to move full-time, but she can't because she loses as much in welfare as she'd gain an extra salary. She needs self-determination. That's a problem that we need right up and down this country. Uh, so many of the problems that we face, the individual people that we ought to be fighting for face, are problems that are completely united throughout this nation. Scotland and England are just simply not so different that you have to sue for divorce. There is a, um, there's, you know, a great Scots phrase that we're, we're all Jack Thompson's bairns, which basically means that we, we may have superficial differences like accents and skin colour, but essentially we're all the same people. Now that is so true for Scots and English. If you actually look at the social attitudes, what Scots think about everything from Europe to welfare reform to immigration to even whether they're proud or not of British democracy, the, Scotland and England have got more in common in all of these important things than the southeast and the southwest of England. It's simply a fallacy 
to think that the Scots are off in some separate political orbit. We're really not. Now, politically, it doesn't look that way, but I'll tell you why. Because when devolution came in, the SNP sent their A-team to Edinburgh, and the Unionist parties sent the Dregs. Now, on a pure political talent contest, you would choose the SNP. Yeah, I might choose the SNP, not that I want Scotland independent. But Nicola Sturgeon is a phenomenon. She makes you proud to be Scottish, watching her up on stage there. But remember, the vast majority of voters couldn't really tell you what's in the manifesto. They don't think too much about the content of a political party. They look at who's a talented lot and who's not a lot of the time. And right now in Scotland, the SNP are sweeping up. But that is not the case, that there are, our political differences are so much that we need to destroy this, this beautiful thing of the union. Um, now, when you think of what England and Scotland did when they were separate, pretty unimpressive countries. Together, we've been amazing. Not only did the Anglo-Scottish Enlightenment invent the modern idea of liberty and, uh, and then sell it to the world, but we did so much. I know Billy groans when people bring this up, but the Second World War was a joint endeavour which formed so much of our modern country. It's, I don't think there's any reason at all to partition this country. We're only 60 million of us. It's not so big. And ultimately, it comes down to two questions. Are the differences irreconcilable? No, they're not. And what can you practically achieve by separation? The answer there is almost nothing. There are so many problems for so many people right here, but separati separation is not the answer. That's my 20 minutes, is oh, yeah. it? No, <laughs> Sorry. Um, are you, you stuck to the deadline as well, very well. <laughs> so, well, there, there we have it. You know, Billy's talking about the sort of transformation that's taking place in uh, British politics and the politics of identity. And we've got Fraser in the time-honoured tactics of praising your opponent uh, before you attempt to take him apart. But, um, the, when I was up at the uh, SNP conference, uh, they're, they're resurgent uh, just now, and their sort of feeling is that uh, they're in a dilemma. They think they're riding high. Uh, they expect to sweep the board in Scotland next May. Uh, and they, they're wor so they think we'd like to have the second referendum, but they don't want to have it unless they're sort of five or ten points clear in the polls for at least a year. Yeah. And there's some big political change like Europe. Um, but they are going, uh, all the commentators in Scotland expect them to uh, sweep the board next year. So the question I have is, uh, is independence now inevitable? Well, the, Sc the Scots, that, that idea that they don't want to go for it until they can achieve it, that's why they don't bother with the World Cup anymore. They're sort of <laughs> like, well, you know, unless we're actually going to win it. Because that's one, one of the things that we have done separate from England. I just want to mention in England have won the World Cup at least <laughs> once. Uh, but the, but the, the point is really that independence is one of a number of different outcomes. The real question, I think, that we have to ask ourselves as citizens of the United Kingdom is what's going to happen to the status quo? Are we just going to sit tight? Because I think it's, it's the inability of the British system to reform itself that has brought us to this pressure point with Scotland. If the, if the system had been able to, let's say, bring in a more fairer voting system, some form of proportional representation, then I don't think the Scots' anger at voting for um, one particular political party and then getting the government from another one would have been such a, a sharp pain to them. They could have taken part in... Um, in coalitions and felt been made to feel part of it. So I think it's the it's the current way that we that we do politics. It's not only uh, about proportional representation. I, I do think that the asymmetrical nature uh, nature of devolution has left the English in a kind of nowhere land. I mean, our problem that we have, that the Scots don't have, is that we don't have a border between ourselves and Westminster. So it's a little bit harder to understand where Britishness ends and where uh, Englishness starts. But it's clear that if, as, as the Scots um, benefit from uh, devolved powers in the way that they can do politics differently from the centre on certain issues, many people in England are thinking, well, you know, why can't we do something like that? So the, the real question is, I think, rather than, you know, the status quo or independence, is when is the Labour Party going to start talking about federalism? Because Jeremy Corbyn cannot expect to go into the May... Uh, Scottish Parliament elections without having something to say to people in Scotland who want greater self-determination. I'm not talking about independency, I'm talking about Devo Max. And if the Labour Party were to develop uh, a, a more federalist 
approach to politics. That would either be an English parliament um, or, because England is larger, regional parliaments, because the English regions are almost all similar size to Scotland, have a similar tax base, apart from <coughs> London and the North East, and would give you that opportunity to do something differently from the centre, which I think is the most attractive aspect of devolution. But so far, the, the, there's been shown no sign from the new leadership that they have any grasp of the idea of federalism, which leads me then to worry that although we have a new leadership and a new politics, we, they're still working on the basis that only the Labour Party itself, holding everything together, can win. That they're, they're, They've got a new, new membership, a new momentum, but the way that they perceive politics remains in that tribalist uh, 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 arena, which has done them so much damage in Scotland. So I, I would like to, to, not necessarily now, but for the party to explore the ideas of federalism and how a more federal, devolving power away from the centre. And you know, when I'm talking about regional assemblies, I'm talking about regional assemblies with the same powers as the Scottish Parliament. Those kind, you know, not just talking shops, not just glorified quangos, but something that really dis devolves power, because this, this, I feel, will address that sense of helplessness that's brought on by globalisation, it'll address that sense of uh, giving p local people agency, and it will bring in a, a proportional representation to the English, because, I mean, I live in West Dorset, I only vote proportionally in one election, that's the European election, I have no other PR election, so my sense of being able to feel that my view is being uh, expressed is, is hidebound by the first-past-the-post system. So I think federalism is the question, or is the thing to, uh, uh, to study rather than are we going to stick with what we've got or, or break the entire country up? Because I don't think the majority of us in the entire island really want to break everything apart. But if that's the only mm -hmm. way to get, if that's the only way to get greater self-determination, uh -huh. if there's no other way of reforming the system, then that's what's going to happen. But I think it's a terrible mistake though, to think that if you give regional devolution to a bunch of politicians, that's the same as giving it to the people. I mean, this, was what, this is what the great Scottish experiment has found. I actually, if I can, I can confess to you guys, there's not many of us here, it's not being recorded or anything. But, oh, it is. Um, <laughs> Trust me, it's been recorded. <laughs> the, in 97, I was supporting the Labour Party, not because I cared much about Blair or Major, because I was so keen on Scottish devolution. I believed pretty much everything Billy was saying up to then, that surely it was power to, time to get more power to Scotland. I had such faith in my country that I thought that we could absolutely come up with better politics forward-thinking ideas that would just embarrass Westminster of how great they were. And, um, and I, I even left um, London as a journalist, went back up to the Scottish Parliament to report it. It has been a complete tragedy. I mean, what happens, ironically, is that politicians hoard the power that they are devolved. Now, right now, I mean, Billy complains about the centralisation of Westminster. It is as nothing compared to the centralisation of power going on in Scotland right now. I mean, the, the, um, David Miliband used to speak about double devolution, and he was right. He's saying it's not enough to give devolution to the local authorities. You've got to make sure the local authorities give it down to the people, to the communities, to the neighbourhoods. This is what, going back to Billy's point of self-determination, to me, I don't think of in, con in constitutional terms. I think of empowerment and self-determination and devolution as being something where you take, take power away from government and to the people. Now, Power devolved is power retained, certainly as far as government is concerned. And right now you've got, for example, Nicola Sturgeon has merged the police, this police Scotland, which has been a, a disaster. You've got Glasgow-style policing techniques applied to the whole country. A poll recently showed two-thirds of Scots have no, um, are, are, are no con confidence in this police force. You get, so all, at every stage, the tendency has been to hoard power in Edinburgh. And ironically, you've now got a situation where when it comes to devolution, somebody who's working class in English has actually got a lot more power. For example, they can choose, if they want to, via the Blair reforms, to send their kids to an independent school in the state sector through school reform, or to a Bupa clinic through the NHS. You can do that in England. You can't do that in Scotland. There is less power, ironically, as a result of devolution. So I think we make a great mistake when we think we can empower people by giving power from one politician, group of politicians and giving it to another, Central government might devolve power right to, to the individuals. That was true under Thatcher, it was certainly true under Blair. Very seldom do we see Cardiff Bay or Holyrood devolving power to the people. I mean, we don't trust their own people enough to actually give them this power we desperately need. The, um, I mean, Billy was talking about uh, federalism and PR. I mean, neither answered whether the question about whether 
independence is now more likely than not. But no, sorry. But, but, um, but how, well, I mean, I think, you know, obviously, we, you know, we've got a, uh, you know, we have a situation to resolve with regards to the referendum on Europe and what that means for our, for our country. And obviously, the, the uh, SNP are, are waiting patiently to see if that does give them the, the necessary uh, trigger for another referendum. But um, I do think that, we, you know, the Scottish referendum isn't happening in isolation. It's, it's one of a number of different uh, uh, issues that are being pushed along by the uh, urge for people to have uh, greater control over their lives. And I, and I totally agree with what you're saying, Fraser, about devolving power further down. I mean, you know, it's, it's notable that Labour only devolved power to places where they thought they had a natural majority, London, mm. Scotland and Wales. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's old-style politicking. Mm. And we've got to get away from that. And, and a federalised... You know, I would, I would like us to have a constitution as well that, that you know, made sure that, that power went, went down as, as far as it could. So it's not a, you know, it's a, like independence, federalism is a process rather than an event. Mm. Yeah, and but, but this, is, this is my mistake. I supported devolution because I thought they were then passage of the power. But it turns out, and I think George Osborne is wrong with his English devolution agenda. I mean, there's lots of devolution going on right now. Power is given to Manchester and nor the North East. You know, people who voted against mayors only a few years ago in city after city are now having mayors foisted yeah. upon them by central government because they gave the wrong answer. Ah. Because George Osborne thinks it will suit his various purposes. And, uh, and I look at it and I think, well, they're going to find out pretty soon that these guys are going to be hoarding the powers and they're not going to be passed down to the people. Uh, I think a referendum, by the way, to answer your question, is, is the second one is less likely because only now are, is it becoming clear that devolution so far, Edinburgh rule, has been very bad for education, for health. The public services are going in a bad direction. Now, if, if actually my original hopes were right, and it was now far more likely that a poor kid from a council house was more able to get to university in Scotland than in England, I would back Scottish independence. If I thought those progressive aims were really like to be more likely by um, more power in Edinburgh. But as it stands, you're twice as likely to get into university if you're working class in England than you are in Scotland, if you're a poor background. And that is, to me, a, almost a slam dunk argument against devolution. It's making things toughest, tougher for those who grow toughest right now. But also, you've also got the, the, the problem, I think, for, for the English, is that the Tories are playing games with, with Englishness. I mean, English votes for English laws is a great yeah. example of that. I mean, you know, I can imagine Gordon Brown the morning after they'd won the referendum to see David Cameron go out there and, and, and announce English votes for English laws. You had one job to save the union. Now you're going to smash it over this ridiculous... Comp I mean, you know, there's nothing... In real de devolution in, in English votes for English laws, it's a complete sham. It doesn't give us any agency. It doesn't give us any uh, democratic control or any... Uh, entity around which to, to start to build a contemporary English identity that's not uh, tainted by uh, uh, the, the empire and by the, uh, the, the racism and, uh, and uh, fascism that hitherto has, has surrounded English identity that people do worry about. I do feel personally that, that um, as we, that's, some of us who read The Guardian know there are many types of socialism, there are also many types of nationalism. And that the, the old Labour Party argument to the SNP that you're all a bunch of nationalists, i.e. fascists, it just, it just falls down when you see, compare the SNP to the BNP. You know, they're not in any way similar. Which of the two of these is the real nationalist party? Well, they're both nationalists, but, you know, nationalism has, has many versions. James Connolly was a nationalist. So, you know, it's not just one, one idea of nationalism that we have to grasp. Um. I agree with you, the David Cameron's remarks about uh, English votes the morning of the referendum yeah. was shocking. Okay, shocking yeah, was. political. I don't get annoyed about politics. Uh, I get annoyed, but I don't get angry. Mm. Uh, but I'd been up all night yeah. uh, covering the referendum, and when I heard Cameron in the... Uh, I would have cast a vote for independence on the spot. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> The, I mean, the main revelation so far is Fraser's admission that he almost supported Blair and <laughs> uh, devolution. But and, and Douglas Murray <laughs> voted for Blair as well. There's, there's something developing uh, here. Uh, some strange, strange. Um, Mugged by reality, I was. The, I mean, the normal pattern Me here too. is um, <laughs> I would ask a few more questions and then for the last five, ten minutes we open up to the audience. But I'd much rather there's the interplay with the audience. From, yeah. So I'm going to throw it up 
throw it open to uh, questions now. If you don't have questions, I've got plenty more to ask, but I'd rather hear from you. Any, any takers? Yep. Thank you. Uh, Fraser was talking about uh, how things are um, better in England than in Scotland in terms of education. For the poor, yeah. Because you can choose to go uh, your, for your child to go to an academy school. Now, how is that possibly devolving power to the people when the academy schools are run by the Department of Education? and completely centralised, whereas at least the state schools are still run by local authorities, which are in fact closer to the people. And just another comment about your idea that it's a good thing that BUPA, uh, people can go to a BUPA clinic via the NHS. That is a terrible, the whole business of the privatisation of the NHS is a threat to the NHS as a whole. And I'm, I just want to mark my despair that somebody as intelligent as you can think that it's a good thing. I'm a conservative member. Just in front of you, ma'am. Just in front of you. Here's a, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Just in front of you. To stop MPs pandying to the populist opinion and what the media are telling them that us, the working class, or the people of the country are actually thinking and feeling, is it not time now to make sure that every man take that responsibility and actually use their vote so everyone is compelled to vote now rather than just the 29, 30% that actually get off their backsides? But now everyone who is part of the union from Scotland, Wales, wherever, we all have to vote. We have to have some responsibility in what is happening to all of us. And but, we all have to do that. But, but the problem is that without a, a, a fair voting system, you're asking people to vote and to waste their time. Look, I don't, you know, I'm no fan of UKIP, but it's totally outrageous that so many of them could vote, four million I think it was, could vote UKIP and just get one MP. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's a fair argument once you, you have a proportional voting system where everybody's more, almost everybody's vote counts. I personally, I, I would let people, freedom of conscience, let people not vote if they didn't want to. It's a matter of making politics... Uh, Engage with people to make people vote, but unless they can spoil their paper, yeah, the fact can, yeah. is, is that they've yeah. turned up yeah. and they've had well, a say in what these people, true, on both, our behalf, are yeah, supposed to be doing. Saying, but first, we do need to have a system that ensures that those people who do turn up, they come away with something, because nothing destroys uh, um, participation more than than going and, and voting, and, and nothing happens. I mean, you know, where I, where I live, the Tories have been in power since 1886. There's no point in Labour saying, where I come from in Bark and Dagenham, Labour were in power since the borough was founded in 1931. The Tories never get a sniff. That's unfair to us in West Dorset. It's unfair to those people in Barking and Dagenham. So it needs to change right across the board. This is absolutely a key part of this move away from first past the post, Westminster, uh, national politics to a more federal, more responsive, more proportional politics. Um, I'm going to let Fraser answer the first question, right. uh, since it was directed at him, sure. and then I'll take the question here and the question here. Look, when it comes to my support for Tony Blair's reforms, I appreciate it's a tough sell to a place like this. Um, <laughs> but uh, w w what can I say? I, I guess, I mean, his, his ideas then, I guess, would now be regarded as conservative ideas. And um, you did give you the health warning that I was a conservative. We, we tend to believe in the, the notion of that the poor should have as much of a choice in education as the rich do. And if BUPA is good enough for the rich, why shouldn't it be good enough for the poor? I, I, I regard it as giving people more options and more power. And, um, and, I, and only last week, Audit Scotland did this report of the NHS saying that one of its big problems is that now it's all under, because they rejected all the Blair reforms, they used the devolved power for that, and aren't coming up with new ways to provide health care, which is providing a, um, a solution. I think Blair was right, and I think that for the last 10 years have amply vindicated the case for public sector reform. It, it is basically, and uh, not for the rich, the rich have always been able to opt out of this. It's needed for those who don't have the choice. And right now, it is far better, you know, being poor and being Scottish is a terrible combination right now. England is the best place to be bright and poor. Yeah. I, and I want to think on the votes, ma'am, because I, just, I think this is really important because I've always been against forcing people to choose between bad options. I think that, like in Scotland, the SNP, they really took off. 
because they came out with a completely new way of doing politics, a very old way if you like, but they were doing stumps, they were having town hall meetings, they were getting people involved. They completely blew the others out of the park by innovative, fantastic, community-related campaigning. Now, the people who'd never voted before voted for the SNP. So that is always a prize there in England for a party that finds a way of managing to energize people, as Ewan says, to go up there during the referendum. It was a revelation, wasn't it, to see the energy on the streets there. Mm -hmm. And you think, why can't this happen in England? Yeah. Now, if any party could do that, those votes would be there for the taking. So right now, I think it's incumbent on the politicians to inspire the voters rather than force the voters to choose between the politicians. And interesting, I was up there for, that, for the run-up to the referendum. And I'd never seen anything like it in British politics until Jeremy Corbyn's candidacy. Mm. And the meetings that accompanied Corbyn's candidacy were, yeah. in, in fact, if anything, more fervent because there were a thousand people outside. Mm. The question is, and this is what I say, this is why I think what's happened in Scotland and what's happened with Corbyn represent a new type of politics. How can we carry that politics forward whilst, pe you know, the, the Parliamentary yeah. Labour Party are trying to... I know, well, the Parliamentary Labour Party are trying to stop it. We've got to convince them before we can convince the British people, which is a tough sell. But, but that, that, that change is out there, and it's how we, we best use this momentum uh, for, for change. And we recognise that people do want agency, how we turn it into something that is positive. It doesn't even have to be progressive. Mm. Phrase. You know, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm as concerned about UKIP voters not feeling they, they get represented as mm. I am anybody else. Mm. You know, and to, how do we turn it into something that that engages people in, in, a, in a kind of uh, a new civics, you know, nationalism aside, a new, a new sort of civics. We need, we need that, desperately need that. So, um, the two gentlemen here. <coughs> uh, I, <coughs> I'm an Anglo-Scot. English father, Scottish mother, born in Scotland, uh, most of my life in England. Um, football affiliations, Allo Athletic and Shrewsbury Town, always <laughs> on the side of the underdog. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my, uh, my first point is uh, that I didn't have a vote in the referendum, like all the other people living in England, and yet uh, we are affected by the result uh, ju um, just as much as the people living in Scotland who have the vote. And the, the other big point I would like to make is that both English and uh, Scottish nationalism is, uh, are ignoring uh, the globalisation which... Uh, is an enormous um, um, matter uh, which affects every single aspect of, of, of our lives, and there's no time to go into any uh, detailed de debate ab about that here, but I just make the point that, that we really must think uh, globally, not uh, as well as uh, I agree with the, the devolution down to the lowest possible level, but it's within the, within the context of, the, of globalization as well. Thank you. My name's Jordan Freud. Um, it seems to me that representative democracy clearly doesn't work. When Zach Goldsmith came to my school, um, I reported on my blog that he had said, lack of voter turnout is not the result of a lack of, it's not the result of apathy, but more of disillusionment. Um, I've got two questions, but very much linked for Fraser. Do you think that conservatives who believe that within an organic so, sort of society that there should be some kind of leaders would allow for there to also be engagement on a local level and also for Billy. I see the Momentum um, campaign as being a nice idea but is the idea of direct democracy actually possible? And if so, how does that shape not just the Scottish referendum if there will be one and also the EU one, because we're stuck in a system where we haven't got this self-determination and agency definitely. you talk of, yeah, yeah, but yeah, is it possible? Can, can, can you say a bit more about what you meant there, sorry, about um, local representation and what, what sorts? Yeah, I mean, the idea of... Um, you want to give him the mic? Yeah. Sorry. Um, just, <laughs> just the idea of, for example, in one constituency, you might want to be able to change some laws, or in England, you might want to change some. But if you're not able to do that within the EU, then you're going to be unable to have any self-determination anyway. And that's something that the media obviously latch on to. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I didn't have a vote in the referendum either, and I doubt I Fraser that. did. So no, so no, best just um, There are good questions there uh, on the uh, not having the vote, globalisation, disillusionment, 
Yeah. Momentum. Well, um, I totally agree with your point on, on globalisation, that the, the issues that we uh, have to, to address, particularly in terms of uh, climate change uh, and uh, of uh, uh, refugees and asylum seekers, uh, are going to have to be dealt with on a, on a, a supranational level. So it's very important that we remain in, engaged in that debate. And I don't think it has to be either or. You can have devolution but also be involved at a, at a, at a higher level. But at the moment, I think the... <laughs> The British state seems to be stuck in trying to hold uh, the square for the way that it's always done things, uh, not to become flexible enough to take on board devolution and also working with our partners in the European Union. It seems to be a very rigid idea of what it means to be British. And in some ways, and my two uh, colleagues here may disagree with me, but it seems to me that, the, broadly speaking, uh, the sensibility in Scotland has kind of moved on from that rigid British idea that we inherited really from, from the Second World War. It's moved on to a different type, of, a different identity. It's a bit more flexible. And I think in England, we, we need something like that. But it's not just going to happen. It's going to need, it's gonna need a, uh, a shock like an independent Scotland to actually make us look at what we are. At the moment, we're very shy of looking at Englishness because we, I think many of us fear that it may look like um, Nick Griffin, it may look like football hooligans. I, you know, I don't believe that. You know, I, you know, I live, I work in England, the English people, I think, have a, as much uh, uh, compassion and as much sense of, of um, society as the people in Scotland, the people in, in Wales. And if we're to make that move, if we're, if we're to stop the racists and the fascists from taking English identity and using it as a way to exclude other people, using our flag to, to intimidate other people, we've got to take it. We've got, to, we've got to articulate a different idea of Englishness that's based on where you are rather than where your grandparents were from or your parents were from. And that's, it's more difficult for us perhaps because we live in a much more multicultural society than our neighbours. But that's, that's the challenge that we face and I don't think we should flinch away from that because we will still be British. We will still be European. It's not either or. You know, national, national identities are not that solid anymore. You know, although we live on an island, we now feel much more connected with the world. So I don't fear the rise of, the, the rise of, a, of a, an English uh, uh, civic identity, national civic identity in the way that, that I know some people are really appalled by it. And with regard to the European Union, I completely agree with what you're saying. The democratic deficit in the European is something I personally have a real problem with. The imposition of TTIP without a real proper debate, all, all of these issues, that's why we need to reform the European Union, not to just sit and wait with whatever comes back. We need to start, uh, and I'm hoping that the Labour Party leadership, the new leadership, are already talking to uh, uh, sister parties, sister socialist parties in Europe about seriously reforming the European Union so that it becomes uh, uh, something that's more really about people rather than purely about uh, the free market. So it's going to be a tough one in the referendum for us. It's going to be a real tough one, not because we... Sorry, Fraser, jump in. But it's going to be a real tough one, not because we don't like the European Union, but because we want a better European Union. How, how are we going to articulate that in a referendum that's in or out? If we want to be in, but we want it to be better, it's going to be a real hard one for us, a lot of us on the left, I think. Sorry, Fraser. That's fine. It's funny, listening to you describe yourself as sort of half English reminded me of one of Billy's um, songs. <laughs> Inga, um, and t was, um, his album about was 2002, was it England it Half was English? Indeed, but, 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 where, where you, it's a sort of album devoted to the project he was trying to describe there. How do you articulate Englishness in an era where to be English is to have, be sort of a great cultural blend, not just of things local, but of things international? And you know, listening to that album, I could have basically substituted England for Scotland and almost all of it. I mean, this is, a, this is a funny thing. I mean, to be Scottish, too, is to be a mixture. I mean, look, Scotland's national dishes, you know, we've got halal haggis, but we have vindaloo. There's nowhere in Scotland <laughs> so obscure that you can't get a curry house. Um, right now, um, Nicola Sturgeon wants police cars in Scotland to have police written in Gaelic underneath it. But Scotland's second language isn't Gaelic, it's Polish, the same as it is in England. <laughs> I mean, we, are, we, we, we Scots and England, we, and when I was listening to it, I'll try to stop myself quoting the lyrics here, but, you know, um, but, 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 but in all of you know, and everything you've sung, Billy, about, you know, for example, in between the wars, you're speaking sweet moderation, heart of his nation, a beautiful line, which I would apply to, to Scotland and British, I had no idea you were singing about England there. And ultimately, you know, there is, it's very difficult, because during the campaign, I, I found my friends, when they were saying, look, 
I'm Scottish, I'm different from being British because we Scottish are more compassionate, we more care. And I didn't like that because that implied somehow yeah. that English weren't so compassionate, yeah. English didn't care as much. And it was completely untrue. Yeah. And it's funny that I used to um, think, yeah. I've got um, three kids, and I used to think of telling my kid that he was half Scottish. I don't know why, until all of this independent stuff kicked off. And then when it appeared... W w this whole identity thing of trying to distinguish yourself, define yourself against the English because you're somehow nicer and better. There's something unpleasant there to me. So I'm just going to tell them they're, they're English, I'm, I'm British, and I'm lucky to be so. Um, now, so, and about your point about power. Okay, last time I'll do this. In Waiting for the Great Leap Forward, Billy starts off <laughs> in his last line and saying, um, start your own revolution and cut out the middle man. Again, even though I wouldn't do this, <laughs> a beautiful <laughs> description of what politics should be about. The middleman is the government. I'm in favour of less government power at all levels, and that's why I've ended up on the conservative side of the debate. Because you heard great leap forth. <laughs> 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 Billy led me to it. You know, this isn't the worst. One time I did uh, Andrew Marr breakfast show, and uh, it was. Uh, Andrew Darling, uh, Alistair Darling was on. He was the Chancellor of Exchequer, and George Osborne, he was the Shadow Chancellor. Alistair Darling asked me if I was still gigging. Oh, I asked him if he was still Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> <laughs> he went off to the green room. The door opened. In walks George Osborne. He goes, Billy Bragg. I was 21 years when I wrote that. I was like, oh. <laughs> what happened to you guys? What happened to you? You were such sweet guys. Listen to the jam, listen to the Smiths. What the this is the radicalising effect Tony of the music Blair. inspired Tony a Blair. generation of conservatives. <laughs> the power of music, now you've seen it all. Uh, That's the power of radical music all these years. I know. You, you don't know what we're talking about, do you, son? <laughs> <laughs> it's all on Spotify, don't worry, it's all there. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I, no, you got it. Um, any more questions? We got, uh, just yeah. There's nobody here, look. We've got just five minutes, five minutes yeah. left. Hang on, wait for the mic. It'll come, speak into it. Hello? Oh. Yes. Yeah. I think everyone's made some really good points. I just wanted to know, I think fundamentally everything feels pretty impotent with the voting system as it is. So when you get down to it, actually, we just need the votes to count. So what, what practical ideas do the panel have for people? Because we're in a terrible irony where... So to catch 22, isn't it, as a people, we, if it, most people would probably agree that they want their vote to count. It doesn't feel like it at the moment. But what can you actually do about it if your vote doesn't count? So what, what can we actually do practically rather than just talking about it? And there's another, there's another person here. No answers. No, 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 we'll take a couple. We'll take a couple and then we'll yeah. nail it. We yeah. will, we will. We've got, we've got suggestions. Don't know about answers. Hey. Yeah, you the mic. Hi, my name's Lisa Ann. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about what you said, Fraser, um, in regards to the Scotland uh, being talked of as being more compassionate and nicer. Mm. Um, I'm a Scottish person living here, uh, seemingly sounding English, but secretly Scottish. <laughs> um, also, the comment you made about um, the SNP being, very, SNP being very clever about their tactics and sending their aces in. Actually, I think their manifesto was red, and it was kinder and nicer and not at all like the Tories. <laughs> Just well, wanted to say that. Sure, but, that, but that's I don't think not, I've got the a Tories question. aren't England, though, and that's my point. And but SNP aren't Scotland. Yeah, Sorry. yeah but I can't, I can't vote SNP. And a lot of people, I think, here would have liked to have voted for their manifesto, the content of it, not for their tactics. Mm -hmm. mm. Sure, maybe they'll get a chance next time. So um, we've got... Five minutes left, so are there other questions? Oh, uh, oh yeah, sorry, Whoa. I see people I up there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so my question is, I want you to imagine uh, that you're standing next year in the parliamentary elections in Scotland, uh, and my question is, assuming you're standing against the SNP, how do you win? Well, you do the Tory one, and I'll do the Labour one. Right. <laughs> All right, so, so, fair? Sorry, there's one more uh, questioner up there. No, no. Okay, right, let's get them. There's only three there. Before I forget them, quick. Okay. okay, firstly, on the issue of the difference between the Scots and the English. If the Scots voters are exactly the same as the English, why does the leader of the Conservative Party in Scotland feel the need to say she's not in favour of the tax credit cuts if they're exactly the same? Something different is happening. I'm not saying that it means that the people are different or that we're harsher, but there's definitely something different 
going on in the political discourse in Scotland. Um, with regard to the lack of um, uh, d you know, democratic reform, what can we do about it? In some ways, I'm going to try and pull that into Matey Boy's question up here about the, about the, the next election. Because if I was standing for Labour in Scotland, I'd be making a pitch for federalism, for a federal um, uh, resolution that gives uh, Scotland uh, what you might want to call Devo Max or Home Rule or whatever you call it, short of um, uh, uh, full independence. And that would at the same time allow me to talk to, to uh, UKIP voters and uh, talk to them about the idea of, a, of a, an English, some sort of English devolved entity, whether it's a parliament or whether it's regional, which would allow me to talk to the Liberal Democrat voters about proportional representation. It would open a whole different politics and it would put me in complete contrast to the Conservative Party who are going to fight on holding the square as it is. Because I see, I don't see the next general election as a foregone conclusion. My theory is that the Conservative Party are about to do the exact thing that did for the Lib Dems and did for Labour in Scotland. The Liberal Democrats suffered because they by getting in bed with the Tories, they did the opposite to what their voters thought they should do. Those people who identified as the Liberal Democrats didn't identify with the, with the Tory government. So by doing that, they, they left. In Scotland, Scot Scottish Labour voters didn't identify with a party that would stand on a platform with the Tories in favour of independence. They saw their party as something else. And now the Conservative Party or the leader of the Conservative Party, is going to say to, the, to his electorate, we want, to vote to stay, want you to vote to stay in Europe. David Cameron is going to say, we're ha going to have to stay in. And I think Conservative voters who identify strongly with the party identify as an anti-EU party. So I think that the, the European referendum could be the iceberg that hits the Conservative Party without them realising it and damages them below the waterline for the next election. And my hope is that the new leadership of the Labour Party is visionary enough and not tribal and goes into the next election with the Liberal Democrats, with the Greens, and with any other party that wants proportional representation and stands on a platform of electoral reform and says to those other parties, if you will vote for us, we will enact electoral reform in as short time as we can and have another general election and we'll sort this out once and for all. Yeah. Right. Um, right. On, on voting reform, I mean, it's funny, that, you know, we had a referendum on this four years ago and voters rejected the... Um, that wasn't PR, though. Yeah, I know, it was AV. It just goes to show that it's very difficult, though, to get voters to think that a new voting system is going to somehow make things better. There's a lot of cynicism. cynicism. I don't think it's... I can't see how it can be surmounted, really, when it comes to the way that the votes are cast. Um, the British voting system has always been firm but unfair. Yeah, that's the way. Um, I, I think, obviously, I would argue the solution is to give politicians as little power as possible so they can do as little damage as possible. But that's, um, that's my way. Um, and when it comes to standing for the Tories in Scotland, actually, I'll do that one. I mean, it's actually not bad this time. But when I left Scotland, things were pretty bad for the Tories. I mean, voting... Tory um, used to be seen as a giant evil, uh, but now when I left, it was seen more like a sort of harmless perversion, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> the sort of the same bracket as sort of cross dressing or cricket or something, you know, something weird that English people did, right? But, um, but now but Ruth Davidson is actually making a, a, a quite a good comeback. She's a, she, even she wasn't a Tory um, a few years ago. She's a convert. And now that Labour in Scotland have turned their back against Trident, remember that uh, Trident is not as universally popular in Scotland as, as you might think, she's got a reasonable chance now of saying, right, she is a party of the Union. For a long while, the, the, there weren't even Conservatives in Scotland. They were called the Unionist Party before 1965. That was, of course, referring to Ireland rather than the Union. But it's advice to say there's a lot of political capital in here. And Ruth Davidson is, I mean, the reason, Billy, that she's distancing herself from George Osborne's appalling plans to cut tax credits is because they go completely against the grain of her sort of working class conservatism. It's a very different brand to Eton conservatism <laughs> that we're seeing there. And she is um, protective of that. And she wants to make sure that that message goes out. And I think she's got a reasonable chance because Labour is still in a complete shambles. I'd love to know how you'd revive it, actually. She's, very, she's definitely very smart with Davidson, that's what I've seen so far. 
But the, the crunch is going to come down to how and where the Scottish people think they are. And I think the momentum is still with the independence movement, with the yeses. And I think that's, yeah. you know, it's going to be very, that's still going to, I think the, the May is too close for the changes that, that, are, Labour, that are yeah. raw, or both what the Tories are doing, mm. what a Tory majority government and the new Labour leadership are not going to be able to have been effective enough to raw a change in Scotland. Uh, before uh, before May, so it's going to be it's very interesting. It's going to mean a lot to both parties, I think. I mean, it's going to be obviously damage um, uh, Corbyn if if Labour don't do well, right. and it could uh, you know it, it could equally go uh, damage damage the government. And then you, and then after that, you've got a European referendum. The worry for us in England is then this whole whole debate is the Scots are in the driving seat and we're not, and it's. It's a strange feeling. It's like, like you said, sir, you know, we don't have a vote. We're sitting here waiting to see what happens. But we must engage ourselves in the debate. We mustn't feel we're locked out of it. And we definitely, definitely mustn't take umbrage with the self-determination of the people of Scotland. We must ask ourselves why we don't have that self-determination and how do we get some pretty damn quick. Um, I'm getting frantic signals from the side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, and I, I couldn't bear to listen to Fraser quoting another piece of Billy Bragg music. <laughs> <laughs> I was just warming <laughs> up as well. well. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, been he's been looking them all up on my website. <laughs> um, uh, many thanks for coming along to this. Um, it was great to listen to the two of you do it in person rather than on Twitter. <laughs> many <laughs> thanks. <laughs>